there, and welcome to In Their Own Words, the story of the American experiment in the words of the people who made it happen. Hi, I'm Pete Fenzel, your host. We're delighted that you chose to spend some time with us today. Today's episode is going to be about the man in the arena. It's the example of Theodore Roosevelt as the epitome of the citizen of a free republic. Now, there is a mountain in the Black Hills of South Dakota that is unlike any other place in America. There, carved into the face of the living granite, are the likenesses of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt. Only 20 years after his death, Teddy Roosevelt had earned so exalted a place in the hearts of his countrymen as to be counted among the greatest of America's great. Why was this? Well, let's take a few minutes and explore the answer to this question. Now, Teddy Roosevelt started out his life as a sickly child. He was asthmatic and, and weak, but there was something in his character, in his makeup, his will, his dynamism, and his persistence that he developed himself into a robust and healthy young man. Now, doctors at the time said to him as a young man that he should be less vigorous in his lifestyle and uh, assume a more sedentary uh, way of living because his heart was weak and uh, they thought that it would be unsafe for him to live so vigorously. And he, at that point, he turned to the doctors and said, no, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what you have suggested to me. And I'm going to live a vigorous life as long as my heart beats, which it did for another 40 years. By the time Roosevelt became president at age 42, he had already served as a New York State Assemblyman and majority, minority leader of the assembly, a deputy sheriff of the Dakota Territories, a commissioner of the U.S. Civil Service Commissioner, the police commissioner of New York City, assistant secretary of the Navy, colonel of the Rough Riders, the first U.S. volunteer cavalry regiment serving in Cuba during the Spanish-American War, governor of New York, vice president, and then president. Teddy's great love of his life was Alice Lee, whom he met while a student at Harvard. He married her in October of 1880, and they had one daughter who was born in 1884. Two days later, Alice died unexpectedly of an undiagnosed kidney failure, which devastated Roosevelt. Only hours before the death of his wife, Roosevelt's mother died unexpectedly of typhoid fever. And now the bereft young man, so devastated, wrote in his diary for February 14th, 1884, as follows. Alice Hathaway Lee, born at Chestnut Hill, July 29th, 1861. I saw her first on October 1878. I wooed her for over a year before I won her. We were betrothed on January 25th, 1880, and it was announced on February 16th. On October 27th of the same year, we were married. We spent three years of happiness greater and more unalloyed than I have ever known fall to the lot of others. <clears throat> On February 14th, 1884, the light has gone out of my life. His diary entry was the last time he was known to have mentioned Alice's name. So deep was the abyss of his grief. Well, Roosevelt retreated from life and he went out to the Dakota territories to do ranching to refine and, and center himself. Two years later, he remarried. He had five more 
robust children and built a home for them on Sagamore Hill near Oyster Bay in, in, on Long Island. Those were, those were happy years for Roosevelt living among his children. But in 1889, President Benjamin Harrison appointed the noted uh, reformer to the United States Civil Service Commission where his skills were needed. He served on the U.S. Civil Service Commission until 1895 when he was appointed as New York City Police Commissioner. There is one episode that is telling. Roosevelt was a great admirer of the Jewish community in New York City because he admired their work ethic. They came from countries that had persecuted them viciously with nothing. And yet, they, by dint of their hard work, their, their industry and their character and their strength, they, they made a new life for themselves here in the New World. Roosevelt identified with that strongly. And so he had a fine relationship with the Jewish community in New York, who nonetheless were subjected to the anti-Semitism of some people. There was one speaker in particular whose name I will not publicized for, let him be uh, forgotten by history. But the, the Jewish community asked Roosevelt to do something about him because he was giving the most horrible anti-Semitic speeches in New York City. Well, Roosevelt said, the Constitution doesn't allow me to stop him from speaking. But he came up with a better solution. He assigned Jewish police officers to be the bodyguards uh, for the security detail for this bigot. And they made him look absolutely absurd and ridiculous by surrounding him with Jewish officers who were responsible for the saving the life and well-being uh, of, this, of this fellow, surrounded by the people he hated the most. And so he became ineffective and forgotten by history, where he will stay forgotten. After two years with the New York City Police Department, Roosevelt was appointed by President McKinley to be Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He increased and reorganized the fleet and placed it on a war footing of preparedness. Spain declared war on the United States on April 24, 1898. And two weeks later, Roosevelt resigned his position as Assistant Secretary of the Navy in order to form the Rough Riders, the first U.S volunteer cavalry regiment during the Spanish-American War. And he attracted Ivy League athletes, cowboys, Native Americans. And despite their disparate backgrounds, they formed a very effective, cohesive unit. Roosevelt led from the front in the attacks upon Kettle Hill and then on San Juan Hill outside of Santiago, Cuba, and, and won renown for these victories. The Rough Riders returned to New York. Two months later, the wildly popular Roosevelt, the war hero, was elected governor of New York. Now, Roosevelt's tenure as governor was marked with opposition by the party bosses who competed with him for power. The party bosses wanted to appoint political appointees to offices in, in, in the state. Roosevelt did not. And Roosevelt insisted that people of merit should be appointed. Well, in the fight that ensued, Roosevelt would not budge. And eventually the party bosses had to give in. And Roosevelt wrote to his friend saying that he was very much uh, fond of the West African proverb of speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. Now, when he was vice president, he used the same expression at the uh, Minnesota State Fair. And many of the political cartoons of the day always pictured him carrying the big stick. In the 1900 presidential election, President McKinley's handlers selected Teddy Roosevelt to run as vice president. They did this for two reasons. One was that they wanted the electoral votes of New York State, where Roosevelt was wildly popular. Second, since Roosevelt was a reformer and a thorn in the side of the political bosses, 
Uh, they wanted him as vice president because the vice presidency was viewed as a political graveyard. And they were hoping that by putting Roosevelt there that he would die a political death. Well, McKinley won and Roosevelt was elected as vice president. But about six months into the second term of McKinley, he was assassinated in September of 1901 in Buffalo, New York. And Roosevelt then became president of the United States. One of the first things that he did was to invite to the White House for dinner Booker T. Washington as a symbol of how American citizens ought to be treated regardless of their race or their background. That the merit of, of the man was the important part. And Roosevelt dearly believed that. As the great reformer and the, and the irresistible force, Roosevelt took on the most powerful men in America. And it started out with, with J.P. Morgan and the Northern Securities Company Railroad Trust fight. Northern Securities had a monopoly on most of the railroads in the North, and J.P. Morgan had a controlling interest in, in this. Roosevelt undertook 45 separate litigations against the uh, monopolies of the time, including the biggest companies in America, Standard Oil, uh, American Tobacco, DuPont, and Swift and Company. He became known because of these efforts as the great trust buster. There, there was one episode that reflected Teddy Roosevelt's character at the time that bears repeating. In the, the autumn of 1902, the governor of Mississippi invited the president to come down to Mississippi for a week of bear hunting as a vacation. And he did. He went. And everybody else in the party caught bears. But Teddy didn't. And so one of the scouts down there captured a bear, tied it to a tree, and presented it to the president and said, here's your bear, now you can shoot him. Teddy wouldn't have any part of it. He said, no, I'm not going to shoot a bear tied to a tree. It's unsporting. And so they had to let the bear go and they ended the vacation. He went back to the White House without his bear. Well, word of this event, of Teddy's character that he would not shoot a bear tied to a tree made the rounds and a cartoonist for the Washington Post made a political cartoon about it showing the president's refusal to shoot a, a bear tied to a tree. And that cartoon went all over the country, of course. Well, there was a couple in Brooklyn, New York, Morris and Rose Michton. They owned a candy store in Brooklyn and they also sold stuffed animals from that candy store. And when they had heard about Teddy's refusal to shoot the bear. They were delighted to hear it. They were admirers of Roosevelt. And one night Rose went and sewed up a stuffed animal bear. They put it in the window of the candy store with a sign that said, Teddy's Bear. And it was wildly popular. And they sold a lot of them. And they sent the original bear down to the White House uh, asking the president if it would be okay if they could use his name for the bear, which he uh, allegedly gave consent to. And so Rose and Morris closed down their candy store and wound up making teddy bears. And they established the Ideal Toy Company, which made teddy bears well into the 1970s. Well, in 1904, Teddy was re-elected by an overwhelming majority. And he considered this as a mandate for new legislation. And he did push through a great number of, of, of laws. First, the Elkins Law and the Hepburn Act, which curbed most of the abuses of the railroad monopolies. Then there was the Expedition Act, which expedited antitrust lawsuits before a three-judge court against the monopolies. And that was a powerful and important remedy. The, F the Pure Food and Drug Act created the precursor to the Food and Drug Administration. And then the Meat Inspection Act was passed to 
curtail meatpacking abuse, which threatened the health of the American public. These accomplishments alone would have earned high esteem for Roosevelt, but he did so much more. He was a conservationist, and he used existing laws to expand federal protection of land and resources. He established 150 national forests. He established the first 51 national bird reservations. He established five national parks and 18 national monuments, including the Grand Canyon and the Muir Woods in the outside of, of San Francisco, where the Redwoods stand. And he's pictured here with John Muir in Yosemite. He established four national game preserves, 21 land reclamation projects, protecting in all 230 million acres of land, which is the equivalent land mass of all the states on the eastern seaboard from Maine to Florida. In addition to being a conservationist, Roosevelt conducted a vigorous foreign policy. First, he was a peacemaker. He kept America out of war, and he negotiated from strength by strengthening America's military and modernizing it. He was the broker for the peace between Japan and Russia in 1905 at the Portsmouth Conference in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which ended the Russo-Japanese War and for his efforts as a peacemaker earned the 1906 Nobel Peace Prize. He supported Panamanian independence against Colombia, which resulted in the formation of Panama as a separate republic, then negotiated a treaty with Panama and, and oversaw the construction of the Panama Canal, which finally was completed right after he left office. He protected Latin American countries from European intrusions and European threats, which was the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And he saw the Navy not only as a military arm, but as a diplomatic resource in order to affect policies. He enlarged and modernized the fleet. He increased personnel and, and training. And he reorganized the Navy to be a far more efficient element of American policy. In 1907, he sent 16 battleships on a round-the-world voyage that lasted for two years as a goodwill gesture, also showing off American strength, America's peaceful intentions, and also, and also performing humanitarian duties when tragedies overseas occurred where American strength could lend support. In all, Roosevelt ended America's tradition of isolationism. Since its inception, America had been co completely preoccupied with settlement of the frontier. With the frontier largely disappearing, he was able to bring America out into the realm of international politics where the young republic could take its place among the more powerful nations of the world. He also created the modern American presidency. Rather than having a hands-off laissez-faire policy of allowing the different agencies to govern themselves and to perform their functions, policy became focused in the White House itself, in the person of the president. This is very much how the presidency functions today. Roosevelt completed his second term in, in, in 1909. Teddy went over to Europe in 1910 to, among other things, collect his Nobel Peace Prize. Now, two weeks before he uh, accepted his Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, he stopped in Paris at the Sorbonne and gave a long talk on citizenship in a republic. In, in this speech, in a segment, only a small segment of the speech, he talks about the citizen who is the man in the arena. And this might be Roosevelt's most famous words. And it's worth, re and it is, it's worth repeating here. And he said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, 
or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Two years later, while Roosevelt was campaigning in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in October of, of 1912, an assassin shot Teddy Roosevelt in, his, in the chest on the right side. His, his metal glasses case and the papers of his talk in his pocket largely protected him from the worst of the, of the, sh of the shooting, but a bullet lodged in his chest. He noticed that he was not spitting up blood, so it did not hit his lungs. And so he declined medical attention. And he told the crowd, I have just been shot, but it's going to take more than a bullet to put down a bull moose. And then for the next hour, he gave his speech to the, to the admiring crowd. This was the man in the arena who was not deterred even by a bullet in his chest. Roosevelt died in his sleep at the age of 60, as his doctors had warned him four decades earlier. He was the man in the arena. He was the irrepressible, optimistic, industrious, big thinking, big acting, big dreaming man of character and great deeds. Much like the young republic that he loved and served so well. That's why he's on Mount Rushmore. And so, for you younger Americans out there, the question is posed to you. Who will you be? The critic or the man in the arena? Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you liked this, give us a thumbs up on YouTube. If you'd like to make some comments, go ahead. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you would share us with others, all your friends, and uh, subscribe to the channel if you would. You'll get notices of any new uh, shows coming up. We do appreciate you joining us. That's it for now. Thanks very much, and God bless you.